Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Tuesday's 10 a.m. Facebook Live. My name is Rachel, Education Specialist here at the Topeka Zoo. And as always, we would like to thank Topeka Collegiate and the Kokari Foundation for sponsoring these wonderful education classes. Now today, we are focusing on second grade curriculum relating to habitats and ecosystems. And I bet you can guess what ecosystem we're focusing on today just by where I am at the Topeka Zoo. We are in our rainforest dome and today we're going to be talking all about the rainforest ecosystem. Now rainforests are vast forests that get at least 75 inches of rain a year and rainforests are found all over the world. If you look at this picture here it's kind of hard to tell but the dark green areas are where rainforests are found. Now they are generally found in places where it is hotter. So you'll notice that they tend to congregate around the equator. Now rainforests only cover about 6% of the total surface area of the earth. So only 6% of our world is rainforest. But interestingly, over 50% of all plants and animals in the world reside in the rainforests. They are important not only because they're home to plants and animals, but we get a lot of our own food, a lot of our own water, a lot of our own materials, our oxygen, our medicine from the rainforest. So they are a very important ecosystem for plants, animals, and for humans. Now rainforests, they kind of are categorized by their layers. And there are four main layers in a rainforest. The first is the forest floor. And a lot of animals that are bigger or come out at nighttime live on the forest floor. Because the leaves of the trees in the rainforest are so big, only about 1% of sunlight actually hits the forest floor. So a lot of animals that live at the bottom of the rainforest are going to be animals that are out at night or that blend in really well with the dirt and the nighttime. And the forest floor makes up about zero to 15 feet of the rainforest in terms of height. Now moving up, the next level is the understory. And these are going to be animals that start to climb trees. So the understory gets a little bit more light than the forest floor and it represents about 15 to 55 feet high in a rainforest. Trees in the rainforest can get super tall. Now the next level is the canopy and as you can see that's 55 to 95 feet high so it's super high up there. So many animals are able to fly. They're also able to climb and to hold onto trees really well in the canopy. And the tallest layer of the rainforest is the emergent layer, and that is 95 feet in the air or higher. Some trees can get up to 125 feet or even taller in the rainforest. So again, this high up, you're gonna have a lot of flying animals and a lot of ones that can climb super, super well. So what we're gonna do today is I'm going to talk a little bit about some adaptations of animals in the rainforest, and then we're going to meet some of our rainforest animals here at the Topeka Zoo. So the first image I have is of spider monkeys. There are seven species of spider monkeys in the world and they like to live in the rainforest. And some of the adaptations, particularly for animals who are so good at climbing, like our spider monkeys, they have very long limbs. They've got long arms, long legs, and even a super long tail. Spider monkeys have a tail that we call prehensile, which means they're able to wrap around the branches and hold their weight from their tail. They even have long fingers as a way to grasp onto those branches as well. So animals like spider monkeys are safest up high in the trees. So they like to stay up in the trees and not come to the ground so predators cannot get them. Now speaking of animals that live in the trees, another example are birds, like the toucan. One thing you'll notice about the toucan is it has bright, colorful beak. That is for them to attract a male or a female partner. Interestingly, scientists have found that the beak also helps regulate their body temperature. Um, so it allows them to help cool off or to stay warm when needed. 
Now the shape of the toucan's beak is actually so they can get really low hanging fruit. So sometimes the branches where the fruit hangs is too small for the toucan to be able to actually stand on it and hold their body weight. So having this long beak allows them to reach up and grab the fruit that is hanging above them. So this beak allows them to eat the fruit that they love in the rainforest. Now speaking of coloring, here we have a beautiful predator in the rainforest, the jaguar. Jaguars are super well adapted to life in the rainforest for a few different reasons. One, you'll notice they have this beautiful coat. They've got this yellow or orangish tan color with these black spots all over them. This allows them to break up their outline when they are in the rainforest so that if they are hiding in the bushes or they're climbing up a tree, it is oftentimes hard for them to spot because they are so broken up. They don't look like a cat, they just look like the bark and the plants in the forest, a rainforest around them. Now jaguars, some of their adaptations as a big predator is they have sharp teeth, they have long claws, and they have exceptional night vision. Many animals in the rainforest, their adaptations allow them to thrive in the nighttime. They are nocturnal. Jaguars, their vision at nighttime is six times better than our vision as humans. So not only do they look like the night and the plants around them, around them, not only do they have predatory adaptations to catch and kill, but they can see really, really well and they can also hear pretty well also. So they are an excellent example of an animal whose adaptations allow them to thrive in the rainforest at night. Now going along with color, not only does color allow animals to camouflage or to find a mate, sometimes the color oftentimes is a warning sign. So this beautiful picture is of a poison dart frog. There are over a hundred different species of poison dart frog in the world. And as their name suggests, they are poisonous. Now this bright color is an indicator of that poison. It is warning predators like birds, don't you mess with me, I am poisonous. If you eat me, you will get sick and you could potentially die. Some native tribes down in the rainforest in Central and South America use poison dart frogs as a way to hunt. They will actually take a poison dart frog, dip their arrow tips in the poison of the frog, and then shoot it at other animals. And that poison is what kills their animals and they are able to eat them. So poison dart frogs, some of them are very, very poisonous. And they come in a variety of different colors. Some are bright yellow, bright green, bright red, combinations of red and blue. And this is an animal that lives in multiple differing layers of the rainforest. So you can find them in the understory, the forest floor, the canopy. They can stick to the trees so they can go really high up or move down lower as well. Now the final animal that I want to talk about in terms of coloring are insects. Oftentimes, animals in the rainforest, particularly the little guys like our insects, they love to mimic the ecosystem around them. Mimicry is where an animal is pretending to be something else, either another animal or a plant. In this instance, both of these are trying to be differing types of plants. So if you look really closely, this is an example of a leaf insect. This is not a leaf on a tree. This is actually a type of insect. The head is here, the body is here, and the legs are underneath. So imagine being a predator walking by this insect in the rainforest. You're not going to see it. It is perfectly blended, perfectly camouflaged to look like its ecosystem. Save with this one. This one is a stick insect. So this one is trying to blend in with the moss and the branches and the sticks around it in the rainforest. So even down to our bugs, our insects, oftentimes their adaptation allows them to thrive in the rainforest ecosystem. So if you are insect 
second grade, I do have a craft for you guys to do that accompanies our lesson today. Linked in this video is this craft. It's one of our favorites. It's the Layers of the Rainforest craft. And it's, an, um, it's something that you can make where you can design your own layers of the rainforest from the forest floor to the understory, the canopy, and the emergent layer. And then you actually get to color some animals and put them into the right levels as well. So as always, once you do this, take a picture and put it in the comments. And if you've been to any of our camps recently, we love to do these in our camps as well. It's a great way to interact with the rainforest and the animals that live there. So friends, rainforests are a vital ecosystem, but they're ones we're not treating very well. It is no secret that deforestation, cutting down the rainforest, is something that is happening at a pretty alarming rate. So as we learn about the rainforest today, think about some actions you can take at home to protect the rainforest. Things like recycling our paper products, using palm oil friendly products, and we'll talk about that at a little bit later date. Um, also, just watching what you buy, making sure things are rainforest friendly. A lot of the products you can buy, like bananas and chocolate, they'll have a Rainforest Alliance code on them. Same with coffee. So many of the tropical items that we love, please just make sure we're getting them in a sustainable manner. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you guys to one of our zookeepers here at the zoo. His name is Joe, and he is in charge of our beautiful rainforest. And he's gonna talk to us about one of the most famous animals here at the Topeka Zoo, our sloths. So I'm gonna introduce Joe, and he's gonna show us Mocha. Hello. So I heard Rachel talking a lot about some of the rainforest animals and their adaptations and one of the things that she talked about a lot was camouflage, uh, which is partly why we picked this spot to talk to you guys today because right above me is actually our sloth, but he's so well camouflaged he's kind of hard to see. So I'm actually going to climb up there a little bit and see if I can get his attention, see if maybe he wants to come down a little bit lower to join us. Uh, I do have some of his food and then we can just kind of talk about him a little bit. Now he may not join us, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a, in a bit, but they are very inactive, particularly during the day, uh, which is actually a very important part of uh, how they're able to survive. Uh, and it's actually not because they're lazy, which is kind of their reputation, but let me just see if he wants to come down for us. to make it through the layers of the rainforest myself to reach him. Hey buddy. You want some lettuce? He's gonna make me work for it. He is not very inclined to help me out right now. So I have some sweet potato. I'm gonna see if he's so he's sniffing it right now. So he's aware and he's interested. It's just a matter of he hasn't decided if he wants to expend the effort of leaning back. Uh, sloths have very poor vision and very uh, pretty poor hearing, so most of their sensory input, how they get around in the world, is through their sense of smell. So I can see his nose going right now. He is, and he's actually starting to drool a little bit. So he is salivating because he smells the sweet potato. Hey, buddy. So Joe, is sweet potato one of their favorite foods? It it is one of Mocha's favorite foods. Uh, his absolute favorite is the hard-boiled egg. So he, that's as far as I can reach. So I'm just going to set this here, and we're going to see if he wants to climb down a little bit on his own. But, and then we can talk about him a little bit. Oh, hey, buddy. Oh, sweet potato is not, um, not exciting enough today. Okay, so I mentioned his favorite food is hard-boiled egg. Uh, a lot of the time when I offer him food, if I don't have a hard-boiled egg to give him first, he will get a little bit annoyed and then kind of turn away and go back to sleep like he did there. Uh, not uncommon. Um, a big part of their diet is fruit. Um, flowering plants if they can find them, but primarily leaves. But if they do happen to find a bird nest, they might eat a bird egg. That would be a nice treat. Uh, one thing I don't know that I mentioned, uh, so 
Mocha here is a sloth, and the particular kind of sloth he is is a Hoffman sloth, which is a type of two-toed sloth. And they are found in a few different countries in Central and South America. So they do have a pretty wide distribution. Um, they do spend most of their time up in the trees. They really only come to the ground to go to the bathroom and to maybe, if they can't go from tree to tree, uh, based on how the branches are, they may climb, walk along on the ground uh, to climb up another tree. And what are some of his adaptations for living in the rainforest, Joe? So some of his uh, most important adaptations, you touched on camouflage quite a bit. Uh, that is very important to a sloth. So their fur helps them pretty much just disappear up in the canopy. So they have not only the brown, which will help them blend in with the trees, uh, they also have sometimes algae growing on them. Now our sloths here don't have that particular kind of algae growing on them, but uh, in the rainforest they usually will and that green and brown patterning will just help them disappear in the trees which is important because they're not going to outrun any predator. Uh, now that's not to say they're defenseless because they can bite and they can uh, swipe out with their claws but their primary means of avoiding being eaten is to just stay hidden uh, and that not wanting to move, not wanting to climb around and stay hidden also goes along with their other adaptation for survival. One of their most important is their very slow metabolism. Uh, they have very, very slow metabolism, very low body temperature. Uh, that actually helps them to survive on food like leaves because as you can imagine, leaves don't have a whole lot of nutrition value. So by staying still and not moving and keeping a really low body temperature, uh, that actually helps them survive. And just for some perspective, human body temperature, our body temperature is about 99 degrees usually. Sloths can be anywhere from the low 80s to the low 90s. So they have extremely low body temperature. Wonderful. And how old is Mocha? I know he's one of our dads here at mm -hmm. the Topeka Zoo. Will you talk a little bit about his age and his babies, please? Uh, so Mocha is 21 years old which we honestly don't have the greatest sense of exactly how long they would live uh, in the rainforest. However, they probably wouldn't usually live that long simply because, especially when they're young, there are a lot of predators between different species of cat, snakes, birds of prey. There's a lot of stuff out there that could eat a small sloth. Um, but in, in zoos, they have been known to make it into their 30s, uh, I think possibly even 40 in some cases. Uh, but they're, they're very elusive, so they are hard to study uh, in, their nat in their native habitat. So there's a lot that we still have to learn about sloths. Um, but you asked about his, his babies that he's had here. Uh, he, Mocha has been at the Topeka Zoo for, I believe, almost seven years now, about six and a half years. And he has had uh, five babies, five or six babies. Um, actually, off the top of my head, I'm forgetting now, in that time basically averaging almost one a year, which is uh, their normal gestation or pregnancy length. It's sometimes somewhere between 10 months to a year. So it's longer than a human pregnancy. Wow. Which makes sense. That would be slow for them too, just like everything else. <laughs> and they do just have one baby at a time. And they will actually, the mom will carry the baby on her body for sometimes nine months to a year until the baby gets big enough that she just decides she's done carrying the baby. And then the baby will leave, and then they are solitary animals otherwise. They really don't, from what we've seen, they don't really interact with each other outside of mom raising a baby or coming together for breeding. And dad does not uh, help with uh, raising the baby. And Jackie is our female. How many babies has she had? I know it's quite a lot. Jackie has had, if I recall right, I believe 16 babies over the course of her life. And she is uh, 30, almost 30 years old. So she's a little bit older than Mocha. Uh, but as far as we know, she still has potentially several years left of life. Uh, she's healthy. In fact, actually, she's getting a veterinary exam today and should be back out in the actual rainforest area later on this week. So we're excited to have her back roaming around. Wonderful, and do we still have one or two of their babies with us right now? We do have one young sloth. Uh, his name is Sago, which is named after a type of palm plant. Uh, he is out and about in the rainforest right now. He is very well hidden. 
Unfortunately, we wouldn't even be able to see him if we pointed the camera there. Uh, so later this week, we should have all three of the sloths out here together. Uh, but like I mentioned, they really, they really don't interact with each other. Now, at some point, probably in the semi-near future, uh, I, we do expect Jackie and Mocha will most likely mate again. Uh, but then they'll just be back to doing their own thing. Sure. Excellent. So we're just taking some questions at home. Eli asks, would you say all animals in the rainforest are endangered because the rainforest is endangered? Um, so Eli, my answer to that is yes and no. A lot of animals don't just live in the rainforest. So some of them that are easily able to adapt to deforestation, to move to a new ecosystem, those are not going to be endangered, but some of them are very specific to the rainforest ecosystem, like the golden lion tamarins, right, Joe? I believe we'll, we're gonna talk about them uh, later this week. So the ones that are a little bit more adapted to only being able to survive in the rainforest, their numbers are not great, but some other animals are able to move a little bit easier. Yeah, so it's not across the board. Uh, and it also depends on how many there are currently and how quickly they have babies. So many of the animals that only have one to two babies at a time are going to be affected way more than animals that can have, you know, a lot more babies, dozens of babies at a time. Good question. All right, let's look at some more questions from home. Um, Eli says, no McDonald's, Burger King, or KFC. Oh, Eli, you're my favorite. So what he is talking about, one of the reasons that deforestation is occurring in the rainforest, particularly the Amazon, actually has to do with meat consumption. They cut down the rainforest to plant things like uh, crops as well as have uh, cattle farms. So many, uh, much of the meat that we get here in the United States is actually from the rainforest, which has been cut down for cattle farming. And so we want to just be careful that we always buy local meat so we are not supporting deforestation for cattle ranching and other types of agriculture. Um, Joe, would you talk a little bit about enrichment in the rainforest? What do you do to build, uh, break their day up here for the sloths? Uh, and you can kind of see he's moving around a little bit. Uh, I don't know if the camera can show it, but you can see his nose twitching quite a bit. So he is very much smelling that food that I put out. Uh, he, like I mentioned, his vision's not very good, so he probably can't really see it very well. Um, but he is definitely sniffing at the food, um, probably trying to determine if there is a hard-boiled egg in there. He was a little annoyed with me a little bit ago when I offered him several things that were not hard-boiled eggs, so we'll see if he does decide to come down while we're here. But uh, you mentioned enrichment in the rainforest. So one of the most important things that I can do for all of our animals is just enrichment and training. And because they do help mentally and physically stimulate the animals, the training, the enrichment might help them exercise, keep them physically active. It might help get behaviors that I need to make sure they're healthy, whether that is presenting certain body parts so that I can check to make sure they're okay, uh, getting them to go into a kennel very easily and stress-free so we can go see our vet. Because you want, to, you want that kind of stuff to be uh, easily done and stress-free done uh, so that you're not trying to do it when they're injured. Because if an animal is sick or injured and then you're trying to work with them on top of them being in pain, that doesn't work very well. So different types of training are very important for their enrichment. Plus it helps uh, get a bond between us. They learn to trust me. It's very important for uh, animals like our primates, like our gold nine tamarins in the rainforest. Uh, training is a huge part of their day. Um, I also do a lot of different types of puzzle feeders. Uh, most animals are very food motivated. So if you can do something that helps facilitate natural food type behaviors, like for instance, our armadillos like to dig a little bit and. Uh, dig around for insects. So I can do little feeders that they have to work through to get small insects out. Um, it kind of just varies by animal's behavior and activity level. For example, sloths are very difficult to do enrichment for uh, because they are slow, sleep most of the day, and aren't always food motivated, uh, not to mention they don't see or hear very well. All that adds up to being kind of difficult. But as I mentioned with Mocha, he does love hard-boiled eggs, so are, there are certain things I can do with that to help get him kind of motivated to do things like maybe climbing into a crate or, or something like that. Right, and I mean, just our rainforest alone, we have so many climbing structures and different mm -hmm. plants for him that that's got to be enriching in itself. And plus just being, you know, wide open, interacting with all kinds of other species is a huge enrichment. You know, one species of bird hears another bird calling out. Uh, they can respond, they see the tortoises moving around, turtles swimming, all of that is a lot of enrichment. 
Right. So earlier you talked about how sloths are so slow because of their metabolism. Um, people are asking how long does it take them to get to the ground and how tall are they and how much do they weigh? Uh, how fast they move is a question of their motivation. So if they're just moving at their own pace, they're not in a hurry, they're not scared, they do move pretty slowly. Uh, if they are threatened by a predator, they can actually move shockingly fast. Uh, so I would estimate, so just give you some perspective, where he is now, he's probably about five or six feet above us. If, if he was annoyed by me, he could climb up this tree and get to the top of the tree in probably 10 or 15 seconds. Uh, they can climb pretty quickly. Uh, they can swing out with their claws uh, pretty fast when they're threatened. Uh, they, they are capable of moving somewhat quickly compared to, say, a big cat or something. They're still very slow. But uh, compared to a lot of the ideas that, that you've, like the stereotypes of sloths, are pretty, they can be pretty fast. Uh, as far as their size, when they're full length, um, from nose to the base of their very tiny tail, which they do kind of have a little bit of a tail, it's just hard to see in the midst of all that fur, uh, they can be close to, not quite three feet long, uh, but if you go the tip of their uh, arms to the back of their legs, they can be, I mean, they're, they're pretty long. Uh, as far as weight goes, that can be kind of difficult because their metabolism so slow, uh, sometimes even half of their body weight might be undigested food and poop uh, and, and other waste. So you may weigh them one day and they might weigh, say, I'd say a typical adult sloth weight might be in the 15 to 20 pound range. Um, but then you weigh them the next day, they might be 10 pounds because maybe they went to the bathroom. So it, it really can vary, but they're not, that's, I would say probably in the 10 to 20 pound range is where you'll find most of them as adults. And Maggie wants to know what is their favorite hiding spots in the rainforest? Right now, uh, our young sloth, uh, Sago, really likes the tree in our turtle unit. And it's, the spot is almost at eye level. So if you're in here, he's there probably three or four days a week. Um, some of his other spots tend to be higher up and less visible. Um, Mocha, right there, he does like this spot. So this, this is across from our tortoise unit by our big waterfall. Uh, he does like it here, but then other days he might be at the top of a tree, very, very hard to see. Uh, but Jackie, she actually really loves to be at the very top of our rainforest dome, up in the metal structure. So if you are here, if you look up way at the top, a lot of times you'll see a brown fluff ball up there, and that's usually Jackie. Huh. She does like to spend her days there. Sure. Um, Maggie also wants to know if we can see the three-banded armadillo in the rainforest, um, or how can we see them? Is there a better time to see Aaron? Is Armelia still here, the baby? Oh, our young sloth is still, or sorry, our young armadillo is still here. Okay. The best time to see them is between 9 and 10. Uh, that's when they're eating and active. In the morning. After, in the morning, I'm sorry. Yeah, 9 to 10 a.m. After that, they tend to go to sleep. They are active early in the morning and late at night, and then during the daytime, they tend to sleep. So they, they are a type of nocturnal called crepuscular, uh, where it's, like I said, very, very late at night, very early in the morning. And how many hours do sloths sleep is another question. So there's actually been some interesting studies on that. Um, the popular belief is that they might sleep between, you know, 16 to 20 hours a day. But uh, at some point I read a study that someone found quite a few sloths, I believe in Panama, and fit them with um, electro caps and they actually measured their brainwave activity. This was a very dedicated researcher who did this. this ha that could not have been easy. But they read their brain waves and what they found, if they interpreted it right, they, we think that sloths might only sleep about maybe eight hours a day, pretty comparable to a human, but the rest of the time they're just not moving. They just, they just stay still, it conserves energy. Uh, just part of that adaptation for living on primarily leaves which have very low nutrition value. So. I guess to short answer, maybe between 8 and 16 hours. Hmm. That's pretty fascinating actually. Something else that's fascinating about sloths, can't they swim? So there are some interesting videos of this. Three-toed sloths despite swimmers, and you wouldn't think that because you think you need more of a surface area on your hands to push the water, and they just have these thin claws and these narrow little pads. But three-toed sloths can swim, and there's pretty interesting footage of it. Two-toed sloths, which is what? the Hoffman sloths are, which is what species Mocha is. Um, we don't know that they can swim particularly well. I wouldn't count them out, 
they might be able to do it, but I don't know that we've really seen them swim. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, three-toed sloths have been seen, and, and there's video footage of them swimming, and surprisingly well. I know, and armadillos can swim too. I just think it's so fascinating, but you know, nature's gotta survive. And sometimes that's handy because say that there's some really good trees with some fruit and nice leaves on across the river, mm -hmm. uh, sloths aren't gonna go around a river. Mm -hmm. So to get across, they need to swim. So. Right. Um, Eli wants to know, what does their fur feel like, soft or bristled? Uh, it's pretty soft. Um, it's, it's long and fairly, fairly dense. Um, they are able to actually drink water out of their fur too when it soaks water. And in fact, the algae that I was mentioning early, earlier that helps them camouflage, uh, they can actually eat that off of their fur too, and they do sometimes, uh, just for a little bit of, of extra energy. But it, it's pretty soft. I, I wouldn't say it's very rough or bristly. Huh. Yeah. All righty, does anybody have any final questions at home for Keeper Joe? Any rainforest specific questions, mocha or sloth, or adaptations? Okay, well, if we don't have any final questions, then tomorrow we will be back with third grade curriculum back in the Gary Clark Education Room. We're talking about keystone species, which is one of my favorite concepts in the animal world. So if we don't have any final questions, no? Okay, then we will see you guys back tomorrow at 10 a.m. Thank you so much, Joe. We appreciate it. Thank you.